Okay, since you're all here, uh, we appreciate if you, let's see, here we go. Come on. Oh, sorry about that. Oh, this is great, right? This is a wonderful demo effect. Right the minute you're gonna start your presentation, that's when your presentation medium crashes. This happens, ladies and gentlemen, and I'm very sorry for it, but it does happen. So here we go again. And now, what is that doing to me? Ah, now it's being nicer to me. I much appreciate that. And, come on. There we go. Um, we appreciate if you checked in. Uh, this is something that takes you to Twitter, and if you take a quick picture of that with your mobile device, uh, it will let everyone else know you're here. If you haven't done that yet, you have about 15 seconds to do so, um, because we are under a little bit of time pressure. This is a very, very crammed tutorial, both uh, attendance-wise and uh, content-wise. We have uh, instructions for you to follow along with this tutorial. Now, this says optional, and that's uh, entirely accurate. Uh, it is completely optional for you to actually follow along uh, with the steps here in this tutorial. All of this material is, a, is available for you on the web, and uh, we're gonna give you a uh, link for that in just a moment. So here it is. That's another QR code there for you, and for those of you who are on a regular device, that is at goo.gl slash capital W lowercase k 4D9N. And those are the, uh, the instructions. You are entirely welcome to follow along, not here if you choose not to, but instead uh, at home, in your office, wherever you'd like. And uh, Adam is going to walk you really, really quickly through um, the checklist here. Most of you have already grabbed the images. And uh, for setting up your host-only networks and booting your admin node appliance and Vagrant upping the other VMs, Adam has just a few words for you, but the rest is all in that uh, material. All right. Oh, the, the script? Yeah, sure. Here we go. Here's our script. So that's the prep here. Uh, you're going you're gonna to need the virtual box. Uh, you want to import the cloud3admin.oba for you. Um, you uh, we need a separate uh, host-only network. Uh, that, is the, um, that is the network with the 192.168.124 slash 24 uh, class C. And make sure that DHCP on this network is disabled. Um, we run into a little bit of a, a, a virtual box limitation here. If you do have other existing host-only networks, uh, to be safe, just delete it and recreate a new one. Uh, that's the one that we found to be sort of the, the easiest. Um, and uh, like we said, we made these instructions available for you, partly because you were supposed to be, or you're going to be uh, um, able to uh, replicate what you're seeing here at home or in your office, uh, but we also do it such that you can follow along with this tutorial by looking at this stuff. So again, here is your, uh, that's, your uh, that's your direct link, and uh, here's, your, uh, here's your quick checklist. That's basically what it amounts to. Say again, please. Yeah, sure, here you go. You want to snap that. I hope that's working for everyone. Google Goggles is really good that way. Question? What about the slides? This, yes, I have the same thing for the slides in just a moment. The slides are on github.io, and I'm going to put that up in just a second. So the files are, all of that stuff is available on GitHub as well. They're Kiwi and, uh, and Vagrant images, so you can replicate that as well. So all of that is also available. Oh, and it would be absolutely wonderful if you could turn your mobile device to silent while you're here. That would be absolutely great. 
Okay, so that's your chat base. Um, this is what this talk is about. We're talking about automated deployment of a highly available OpenStack cloud. And these are the slides, the rendered slides uh, of this presentation. So that's exactly what you're seeing here uh, in the background. That is all on github.io. Uh, you can also um, replace FGHOS with Aspires because then you get Atom's branch of this, but it's essentially the same thing. What you're going to learn, <laughs> go ahead. I'm gonna, I'm gonna put this up in, I'm gonna keep this up for about a minute or so while I keep talking. Um, so generally what to expect uh, from this tutorial, what you're gonna learn here um, is, and I'm gonna give it about 10 more seconds, so take your pictures now. 10, 9, 8, 7, 6, Five, four, three, two, a half, a quarter, done. So what you're going to learn in this tutorial is uh, first, uh, we're going to address the question of why exactly do we want OpenStack HA, uh, and specifically OpenStack Infrastructure HA. Uh, so what are the infrastructure high availability options uh, that, we, that we need, and what are the high availability requirements that we need to address with an OpenStack? Since this is not meant to be a product pitch, uh, we are going to walk you through what are the options that specific OpenStack vendors offer in terms of high availability. There is not an OpenStack distribution available today that doesn't address high availability in some shape or form, but they all happen to do it differently. And it's good to know how specific vendors do certain things, um, so we want to walk you through that. And then finally, uh, we want to explain to you how SUSE Cl Cloud does this specifically. But before that, uh, we owe you a very quick introduction. Um, so the person here uh, in the front is Adam Spires. Uh, Adam is a, a professional cellist uh, who was classically trained from age zero, practically, and has uh, recently uh, diver diverged into jazz and tango. Uh, he is also a lapsed ex-semi-pro triathlete and he happens to be uh, an engineer at SUSE working on uh, OpenStack and high availability technology. And this is Florian Haas, hey. uh, who I, I guess many of you probably know him from uh, pretty much every, every summit previously where there's been an HA session and Florian's been involved, um, very much a leading figure in the OpenStack HA community, authored pretty much all of the OpenStack HA guide. Right? Co-author. Co-author, co okay. I had a fair amount of help. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> um, and he has a very patient family, I guess, because <laughs> he travels an awful lot and um, yeah, likes food. And uh, founded and is CEO of Hastexo, um, professional services company specializing in cloud virtualization, storage. And uh, things. And things. And things. Clever stuff. Right, yeah. exactly. So why, why do we actually want uh, high availability in OpenStack. This is actually a more controversial question than you think if this is your first OpenStack summit. Um, as Adam mentioned, I led one of the first uh, high availability related design summit sessions in San Francisco in March of 2012. And there, this question had not been settled. So there were people that basically said, well, we don't need to address high availability specifically in OpenStack for the simple reason that everything's distributed, right? Uh, everything is shared nothing, and whenever one of our components fails, we always have another one that can take over, right? Well, actually, that's not quite the case. Uh, many of you will be familiar with this little graphic. Uh, this is from Ken Peppel. Uh, it's been in various pieces of OpenStack documentation for a long time. It's basically an overview of the OpenStack uh, architecture, and when you look at this simplified view of OpenStack. This has no heat, this has no trove. It's like really, really simple. Um, but if we look at this simple graphic, out of those seven components that are mentioned here, we have no fewer than five, uh, which means the majority of our services that actually rely on shared infrastructure. And in particular, that shared infrastructure consists of our MQP bus, um, that is either RabbitMQ or, or Cupid. 
So that's one example. This is what OpenStack uses to pass, me to pass messages between services. Those messages are considered volatile and are expected to generally have a lifetime of 30 seconds or less. So we can't do without this. We need AMQP connectivity and AMQP communications uh, for the majority of OpenStack services to actually work. But the only thing that we really need to care about is uh, that the service as such is available, not so much what data is in its bus. Because uh, what we have on the AMQP bus is inherently not stateful. Uh, all of OpenStack is basically built to um, resend uh, messages when they get lost uh, on, the AMQB, uh, on the AMQP bus. Um, and so generally, we have to have one, but the data that's in there is relatively, I wouldn't say, it's, it's certainly important, but it's not important that we actually uh, replicate that data over multiple locations so that we still have it, have a, a certain data set when one of our AMQP services fails. Uh, that is striking, strikingly different from another problem domain, which is uh, relational database management systems. Um, and by default, most people will be using uh, MySQL. Some people use Postgres. But uh, relational database management systems is where we store non-volatile, that is to say persistent data in, in OpenStack. And now this is a bit trickier than the message bus problem. Because um, as far as our RDBMS is concerned, we can't do without it, just like for the message bus. But in this case, the data that's in there is actually really, really important. Uh, it's stateful. We uh, have to make sure that it is available to a backup service when the primary service fails. And uh, we need to replicate or have some way of not only keeping our service available, but also to keep the data available that's in it. So what is it that uh, infrastructure high availability actually does for us? So on the one hand, uh, the infrastructure HA bits in OpenStack ensure service availability. So uh, we need to make sure that our critical services are running uh, and are responsive. And for those services where it's relevant, we also need to make sure that we have data availability. So for stateful services, we additionally need to ensure that they can find their data where they need it, which may or may not involve replication. It may involve sharing of that data, it may involve replication, it may involve something else. So uh, how do vendors, how do individual uh, OpenStack vendors approach this? Um, and when we talk about that, we need to really talk about three different things. Uh, number one, how do they deploy their OpenStack cloud in the first place? There's uh, many approaches to that. Um, and when we talk about what they use to deploy OpenStack infrastructure, that's also normally the uh, deployment facility that they use for an HA manager, kind of obviously because everything else would be brain dead. Um, the second thing that we need to look at is what do uh, specific vendors use for HA management? So what high availability manager or managers does the vendor support for ensuring service availability? And finally, uh, how does a particular solution ensure state management and data availability? So that is where all the replication or shared storage management and so forth comes into play. So um, one of these, uh, arguably the first distro vendor that put high availability somewhere on the map for a generic Linux distribution that supported OpenStack was Ubuntu. Uh, they were probably the first established distro vendor to put HA on the agenda. Now, when we look at Ubuntu, what do they use for deployment? Well, they generally tend to favor Juju, Juju and or Mass. Um, they use the Pacemaker High Availability Manager for management of highly available services. And they tend to uh, focus on Ceph for replicated block storage, Ceph RBD to be precise. So that was sort of the first one. Um, then there is another vendor that cared about uh, high availability and still cares about high availability a lot. Uh, and that's Cisco. And Cisco basically said, oh, this, all of this pacemaker stuff is like way too complicated and complex. And the user experience and the, and the UI are generally awful. And it's uh, horrendously complicated. 
Uh, and they came up with an alternative solution uh, that were you to print it out on standard ISO A4 paper uh, would fill 57 pages of documentation. So much for reduced complexity. Um, but what they do uh, is they use, other than uh, Ubuntu, they prefer a deployment mechanism that's very well known and established. So that's Puppet. Um, they focus on that very heavily. They use HAProxy and uh, KeepAlive D for, um, uh, for the actual uh, high availability. And as far as replication of data is concerned, they take an approach that is very much centered on application specific replication. So for MySQL database, they would use Galera for, um, the, uh, for, for uh, RabbitMQ replication. They use SyncQs, mirrored queues, that sort of thing. So all very much application based, so you don't rely on something like shared storage or replicated storage um, for that purpose. Um, we have uh, another vendor that has uh, HA relatively high on the agenda, and that's Piston. So that was one of the first OpenStack vendors to actually recognize that HA is important. Um, you will, however, find that uh, Piston is completely unlike the other platforms that we're discussing here, because all of what Piston does in terms of high availability is um, uh, built into or makes use of basically their secret sauce, which they call Moxie Runtime Environment. And then uh, there is a vendor that was relatively late to the party as far as high availability is concerned. In fact, even as far as OpenStack in general is concerned, but they certainly have caught up, and that's Red Hat. Um, and uh, they only very recently went public uh, with an HA solution. Uh, they also focus on Puppet for deployment, uh, but they generally tend to sort of advocate that you don't uh, deploy with naked Puppet, but instead uh, with the foreman. Uh, they also make use of Pacemaker for high availability management. And as far as state replication of the database is concerned, uh, they are very much focused on Galera. And then we're at SUSE. And uh, in SUSE, what we have is uh, deployment with Crowbar. Um, and we're going to get into these a little more, uh, in a, with, a little more precisely uh, later on. So Crowbar for deployment. Uh, Pacemaker and HA proxy for HA management. That is uh, Pacemaker for, uh, for uh, services that uh, do not need load balancing and Pacemaker managing HA proxy for services that, that do. And uh, various bits and pieces related to shared, st or vari various solutions that are uh, supported related to shared storage uh, and or DBD. So what exactly is the SUSE Cloud thing? Um, so let's take a quick look at, at what that is all about. So SUSE Cloud is SUSE's OpenStack-based cloud product. So there was never a SUSE Cloud that was not OpenStack. Um, it is an OpenStack cloud deployment and management solution, which includes um, SUSE packaging of OpenStack components and automated deployment of management facilities, generally what you would expect in an OpenStack product. Its first release was called SUSE Cloud 1.0. Uh, it was based on OpenStack Essex. It was released in 2012. Um, the second release was called SUSE Cloud 2.0, which, uh, which was based on Grizzly, released in 2013. And since we had SUSE Cloud 1.0 and then SUSE Cloud 2.0, it follows logically that the next incarnation is just SUSE Cloud 3 without a zero, in the interest of continuity. Um, this is uh, based on Havana. And this was the first uh, SUSE Cloud distribution that actually involved uh, HA support. It is, as you would expect, based on, whoops, sorry, it's based on SLES 11 SP3. I'm not a SUSE employee, so I get to say SLES. Their marketing department basically bangs their guys into submission, always says you have to expand the acronym to SUSE Linux Enterprise Server, but I get to say SLES. Um, which is, of course, sort of the latest release of uh, SUSE's uh, enterprise Linux product. So with all that said, SUSE Cloud may look just a little blurry to you still. And what we're going to do next is we're going to make that a little clearer for you. So um, a very important concept uh, in SUSE is the concept of node roles. 
Uh, so in SUSE Cloud, deployment and management of services is, is centered on this concept. And the concept of node roles, by the way, is uh, not unique to SUSE Cloud. It's a rather common method of abstracting uh, node functionality. And uh, generally, the, the node role types that we have uh, in SUSE Cloud is there is an administration server uh, which runs uh, the, the crowbar components, but also a, uh, a Pixie Boot server and TFTP server and so forth. Then we have the control node. This is the stuff that actually runs the uh, OpenStack control services. And then we have essentially any number of compute and or storage nodes uh, that, we can, that we can run here. Okay, so what about this crowbar thing? Um, show of hands please, who's heard about crowbar? A few, okay, so there's, for the rest of you, there's gonna be something new here. So what is Crowbar? Crowbar is a software deployment and automation framework that, uh, that originally came out of Dell, and it has a very, very unique distinction. Out of all the software projects out there, open source or non-open source, Crowbar has by far the scariest mascot ever. Uh, if, if, if your small children do not get nightmares from this. <laughs> you have been a terrible parent. I mean, look at the eyes. It's evil. Um, the, the story behind this is, of course, um, it was originally sort of a naming discussion within Dell. They basically said, okay, we have this deployment framework, but we have no name for it. Someone get f got fed up with it and basically said, well, shoot, for all I care, it could be named Purple Fuzzy Bunny. Um, and Purple Fuzzy Bunny is not a good project name, but it serves for a mascot. But why they had to add this horrible bow tie, uh, these terrible switch off eyes, uh, and this Malay weapon, I do not know. But it's Please. so cute and fluffy. It is not cute and fluffy. It is the stuff of nightmares. Uh, you, did, you, did you read Stephen King for bedtime stories when you were a kid? <laughs> Something like that? Um, so Crowbar has individual application uh, deployment units, uh, which are called uh, bar clamps. And uh, there were some uh, interesting uh, design goals and, and interesting design paradigms that were uh, looked at and were observed when uh, these HA components were added to Crowbar. Yeah, so um, the first thing that we, want, that we decided in architecting this uh, in the early days was we wanted obviously to be able to build a, a highly available cloud from scratch, but we also wanted to support people who already uh, had a cloud out there. And uh, it, it generally doesn't go down too well, it turns out, when you ask somebody to tear the whole cloud down and rebuild it from scratch. So we decided upgrade was a, was a pretty uh, key thing. And we wanted to be as, uh, as flexible as possible in terms of where you put stuff. So we didn't want to dictate that you have to have one cluster or two clusters or three clusters. We wanted to leave that up to you and give you the control about where you put stuff uh, within those clusters and what the size of those clusters is. So we didn't want to be too opinionated. And we also wanted to allow growing the, the cluster later on um, because obviously demands change over time and it's good to be able to, to scale out. And obviously we want the whole point of this talk, right, is, is that we wanted to automate this as much as possible and avoid a kind of pet situation, which is a, the traditional approach to HA clusters with things like Pacemaker. You do end up with a bit of a pet type scenario rather than cattle. Um, you, you know, it takes kind of a lot of manual setup to build the clusters. So we, we wanted to avoid that, reduce complexity and reduce learning curve as well because uh, you know, building clusters is a complicated thing. So we wanted to expose the, the options that need to be exposed for flexibility, but hide the rest. So the way we did that was by introducing a new bar clamp to Pacemaker. And I suppose we, we better just quickly explain what um, bar clamps are, right? Because we didn't. Uh, so a bar clamp in Crowbar is just basically a deployment unit that lets you deploy something like, say, Keystone. Um, it encapsulates uh, the, the logic, the configuration management logic for how to, to provision it. 
it encapsulates um, things like the, uh, uh, an interface for, for exposing the parameters that are available for that deployment. Um, and it just makes the deployment of one component of something like OpenStack a nice, easy thing to, to deal with. So we built a, a new bar clamp, as I said, called uh, the Pacemaker bar clamp. And this had two key functions, really. One was to provide library code for the other bar clamps so that we could, without being too intrusive to the existing code in the other bar clamps, uh, extend them and add HA support to those using this library code in a reusable uh, fashion. And the second main function of this bar clamp was to uh, just automate the deployment of the base clusters, um, or cluster if you choose to only deploy one. And that includes deployment of the, the, in, the cluster interfaces that let you manage the cluster. And in that, we support interacting with the cluster through the web interface, through command line. And there's also a desktop uh, GTK native client for Linux. All right, should we cut over? Yeah. There we this go. And, <coughs> and uh, if you bring up your, your Vagrant box, I'm sorry, your, not your Vagrant box, your OVA, your virtual appliance, uh, and you boot that up, uh, it has basically all this stuff already pre-installed. If you haven't been able to do that while we were talking here, while we're doing the intro and following the steps, don't worry about it. Like we said, the steps are fairly self-explanatory. You can do it now, you can do it later on. Uh, you may get more out of this when you're, when you're able to follow um, Adam's demo along. Um, but this is entirely up to you. But when you do bring this thing up, um, then it comes up with a crowbar interface uh, that is uh, password protected. The password is super, super, super secret. So please, this stays in this room. Don't tell anyone. Um, you're going to log in with a crowbar. And uh, your password is going to be lowercase c, lowercase r, lowercase o, lowercase b, lowercase w, lowercase b, lowercase a, lowercase r. OK. Top secret. And there we go. Um, do we want to save this password? Chrome is asking me. Well, it's pretty hard to remember. So. Yeah, it is. Well, actually, no. This, is, this, is, this would be way insecure. So here we go. Yes? Say again, please. Oh, yeah, the host network. So I. Yeah, yes. OK. So, so very briefly, uh, in, your, in the, uh, uh, in the uh, attending instructions uh, that you uh, were able to grab earlier, uh, there, is a, uh, there is something about a host-only network that you need to define uh, in VirtualBox. Um, if you have already uh, defined a, a host-only network on your VirtualBox, please just remove it. You can always bring it back later. And uh, the uh, network uh, configuration is also in uh, that, the configuration for that host-only network is also um, in your attendee instructions. Um, this is basically a quirk uh, that we, a, a virtual box quirk that we need to uh, work around. You may be uh, aware of the fact that if you want a NAT interface, which is the only type of interface that lets virtual box actually talk to the internet, that's always F0. Um, and for, the, for crowbar to actually talk to individual nodes, we have to have a separate, uh, separate interface. Um, we can, hang on a second. So let's, this was, this thing that we showed uh, in the very beginning. So let me quickly pull it back to that. So these are the attending instructions, and here's that. So if you want to copy that down real quick, then you can do so. OK, so that's in your attending instruction. Like we said, if, we're not, if you're not there up to this point, no worries. You can follow all of this from the comfort of your home or office. Uh, I'm sure many of you are exhausted from the summit or maybe from the parties. I don't know. Um, so by all means, you will have uh, plenty of time to uh, duplicate this. OK, now we need to go back to where we were. So, Adam, can you? So the the question was, uh, there is uh, there is no uh, option to use uh, DHCP here. 
Um, just can you can you do us a favor? Let's let's try this. Okay. Uh, when you have a question, a general question for the audience, could you raise your right hand? And if you just need help with the setup, then raise your left hand, and then one of these friendly SUSE folks will stop by. Okay. If we ha if we actually have too many here, then I'm sorry, we're just not going to be able to cater to everyone because otherwise this becomes uh, a terrible mess. Okay. So uh, it, it seems that on if you're using a Mac, the virtual box interface. Oh, I was the wrong menu. Okay. De depending on the version of VirtualBox you're using, it also, uh, I think in, in 4.2, at least on, on Linux, it kind of hides the NAT <coughs> networking option. It only give, exposes an option for host-only networking. Um, and, and in 4.3, it gives you, it exposes both in the interface. But you really want one NAT network and one host-only network, and it's critical that the host-only network has the IP address correct, as in the guide, and it also has DHCP turned off. That's very critical, otherwise it's, it's not going to work. OK. Um. OK, so um, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to start going through the, uh, the interface of the, the various bar clamps so you get a feel for what crowbar looks like, what the various options are that are exposed, and the order that things get done in. Um, but hopefully you'll, you'll see it's, it's pretty simple. So uh, the first thing we're going to do is set up the new cluster. And um, so we go to the pacemaker bar clamp for this. So this is at the drop down at the top. And so the, here's all our OpenStack bar clamps. And they're, they're ordered in, the, in a, a typical deployment order. So if you just go through these kind of starting at the top and working down, then, then you're probably going to be doing it right. So the first step is to um, create what, what crowbar terminology is. Um, it's a, a, a proposal, which is a, a slightly strange choice of word, and it actually um, ended up changing with Crowbar 2. Um, but the, the idea is it's a, a, pro a proposal for the thing you're about to deploy. So the, the, you, you, set it, you set the configuration, and then you apply the proposal, and you end up with the deployment that you requested. Um, and in, in the Pacemaker case, the name of the proposal corresponds to the cluster name. So we're just going to rename it to Cluster 1. Is, is there a mouse? Like, can I use this, this as a mouse? Or? Oh, great. Oops, sorry. Oh, I can't. Uh, it's fine. Okay. All right. So we're going to create this proposal. And now here we can see the options um, that are exposed for creating the cluster. So um, the first critical option is, is how to deal with quorum. Um, for those of you familiar with uh, HA cluster theory, um, you need quorum so that uh, within the, the cluster so that the nodes um, have a majority and there's, there's no uncertainty that the, of the split partitions within the cluster. And here's where we get to everyone's favorite acronym when they deal with clusters. So if you haven't heard of STANIT, that obviously stands for shoot the other node in the head, uh, which is a uh, fine way of ensuring that a cluster node is in fact down when you think it is down. Um, and there is multiple ways of, uh, of doing this here. Uh, we are going to be configuring this with uh, SPD. Uh, which is a there we go, which is one way of doing uh, which is one way of doing fencing, uh, which uh, in this virtual setup has the added benefit of not relying on any out of band management like IPMI, which tends to be not available in a virtual box environment. So we're going to use that. Yeah. So um, actually, uh, I need my notes up. Um, 
So for those of you who have already got through uh, the, the point where uh, it says Vagrant Up and it, it boots up the two controller nodes, you'll have, uh, at the bottom here, you'll have two extra available nodes. And you can go ahead and drag those into the Pacemaker cluster member um, box there and also the Hawk server member. And at that point, you'll see uh, they'll also appear in, the, in this list of node names here. So and what we're going to do is um, Adam is just going to bring those nodes up right now um, while I'm walking you through uh, the uh, configuration steps and what they mean and what they're good for. We do have a few slides for that as well. Uh, so, oops, sorry. There we go. All right. Okay, so uh, we need to set a specific uh, con configuration mode for uh, Sonith. Um, we uh, configure that with uh, Sonith block devices or SPD. Uh, SPD uh, in these images has actually been pre-configured on the uh, def STC drive. And we have, um, we're using uh, DRBD for um, Postgres uh, storage, and there you would also have other options uh, like, for example, um, sand storage and uh, so forth. Okay. Um, sorry, I forgot, I forgot to say one thing. Uh, it's, it's in the guide, but just to emphasize. So when, when your controller nodes come up, um, you can go to uh, the, the nodes at, at the top of the screen. There's a, the nodes drop down, and you can click on uh, bulk edit and just rename those nodes to controller one and two um, so that because by default when the the nodes come up they they register with crowbar and the, the the primary mac address the mac address of the primary interface is is taken as the host name uh, obviously that's not a very sort of friendly thing for dealing with when you're allocating roles to nodes so if you just rename those it, it, as described in the guide to controller one and controller two so and and yeah, so if you do that before um, creating the cluster, then you'll see the, the names appear um, in, in the, the drag bit at the bottom of the pacemaker bar clamp that I just showed to you. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, so if, if you want to connect to any of these machines directly, you can do that. Um, you can either, well, probably the simplest way is just to SSH to the IP address. Um, so the IP address for the, the admin node, which was the first one you booted up, is uh, 192.168.124.10. Uh, they're all on the same slash 24 subnet. So it, it's dot. Um, oh, you mean the SSH, so the question was what is what are the cr login credentials for the admin node? Um, you mean the SSH credentials or? Uh, yeah, so the SSH credentials, uh, it's just root Linux. It's, it, it's, but it's in the guide, I think. It should be in the guide. Yeah. Is there a que question over here somewhere? Sorry? The notes came up, but they failed to register with your OK. So hands up who's got the uh, admin node booted. Ah. OK, that's. And, and who, who's, uh, so you, you're able, who's, uh, who's able to see the web interface? OK, so it is working, right. <laughs> uh, so who has got to the point of doing a va vagrant up for to the controller nodes? OK. 
And are they appearing in the in the in the crowbar interface? Yeah. Okay, cool. Yeah, so the the um, so we, we originally wanted to provide you with a single OVA with all the VMs just pre uh, pre-built and pre-registered to save time. Unfortunately, it turns out that VirtualBox has a number of significant bugs when it comes to OVA export of multiple machines, uh, especially when it comes down to shared disks, which we need. So we couldn't do that. So this was the, the compromise that we chose was to pre-build the admin node um, and then to build the other ones through Vagrant. You can actually, from the materials that we give you, do Vagrant up of all four. So you can build the admin node from scratch yourself but we just provided you with the OVA to save time. Uh, so, so of the people who managed to get their controller nodes up, have you been able to rename those in the bulk edit? Yeah, okay. Um, and then you, you're able to go to uh, pacemaker bar clamp and drag those into the, yes, yeah, so, okay. So it looks like people are getting there. It, it, it's gonna take some time because the vagrant up uh, of the to controller nodes and, and the compute node as well. Um, it, it does take some time to, to build those VMs from scratch and then to register them against Crowbar. Yeah, that's a good, so the question was in the in the bulk edit page, should you change the change the alias or the public name? Very important that you ch change the alias, not and don't touch the public name. If you give it, give it a public name, it actually expects that refers to uh, entries in an external upstream DNS effectively, um, which is used for other things. And obviously, in this scenario, it's a standalone thing. There is no upstream DNS, so um, things will fail later on. Great, okay. So, uh, where's my mouse gone? Oh, there it is. Okay, so here, here are my two controller nodes that I'm talking about. And there's also the compute node as well. Thanks. Yeah. Okay. Uh, so I'm gonna drag these into the two controller nodes into, so Pacemaker cluster member um, is, is one of the roles that we were talking about early, earlier. So when you allocate the, the nodes to those roles, they become members of the Pacemaker cluster. And we're also gonna allocate them the Hawk server role. Hawk is a web interface for looking into what's going on in the cluster. So we're gonna automatically install that so we can have a closer look. Uh, so, the, so the SSH password for the admin node is so it's root Linux, and the as we said the super secret web interface credentials earlier is crowbar crowbar. So once you've dragged uh, the controller nodes into those roles, the, there are per node settings for SBD. Here, um, so we have to we have to tell the bar clamp which block devices we're, we're going to use for SPD, the fencing device, um, on each node. And these have been pre pre set up. There's a shared disk um, that Vagrant will have set up for you automatically between the two controller nodes on SDC. Where's slash on this? <laughs> so hang on a second. So this is where, this is why the FSTC, oops, that was one S too many. Maybe I should turn this on. The FSTC for the, uh, for the block devices, the FSTC, here we go. And uh, where is our DOBD down here? Here, prepare cluster for DOBD. True. 
And if you so feel like it, you might also want to uh, do the non-web GUI or HP GUI for a pacemaker, if you're familiar with that, if you would like to do that. So, and off we go. Question there? So if, if, you, if you have a Windows specific issue on your virtual box, please see us later. <laughs> Thank you. Maybe one of our glamorous assistants can, can help. Um, I'm, I'm just going to rattle on with this because we need running a bit behind. Yeah, okay, so we can, we can zoom that screen in a little bit, but what we also have for you is we have a few slides here. So this is what you want to set. Uh, you want to set, oh, sorry. Uh, I was, I was saying we could zoom in on the screen, but we also have a few slides for you here. So you want to set SPD, which, is, uh, which has been pre-configured for you for DefSDC, but you need to add that on Pro Controller. Um, and this, by the way, is also all in the admin instructions. Uh, you, want to set, you, uh, you want to enable your cluster for DRBD, uh, for uh, Postgres storage, and whether or not you want to uh, install your pacemaker GUI, yes or no, is essentially up to you. So, there we go. All right, let's go ahead. Okay, do that. And um, that just for fun, we're also going to install the, uh, the <coughs> Linux native client, which is called HP GUI. That's this one here. Just making sure that I've got everything. Yeah. Okay, let me. Then we hit apply, and uh, at this point, Indeed, uh, do that. okay here. So while that is working in the background, let's uh, talk really quickly about what's uh, special about what SUSE Cloud does about Pacemaker and Crowbar. Um, as Adam has already mentioned, uh, it basically provides library code for individual services, OpenStack services, to then make themselves highly available. Uh, which is kind of cool. Um, there is a basic idea of usurping system v uh, init or normally system v init managed services uh, for Pacemaker. Um, and then of course in Pacemaker we have things like maintenance mode to deal with, with restarts triggered by config, config changes. Uh, we can do migrations and, uh, and whatnot. Um, DRBD is used for uh, replicating Postgres storage, HA proxy is used as a load balancer, and there is an automatic cluster configuration. For those of you who hate high availability clustering because it's complex to set up, this is what takes that complexity away from you. So um, this takes care of quorum setup, uh, this takes care of setting up fencing, uh, including protection from what we call a shootout at the cluster coral, which is two nodes uh, trying to, to fence each other. Uh, and it also installs the appropriate uh, UIs. So uh, in a way, it provides orchestration and synchronization of uh, your services. There is a flexible node allocation and the appropriate uh, UI uh, extensions, and uh, you also get uh, notifications. Um, now with that, that sort of our, um, that's the, the very basis of our, uh, of our high availability system um, with Pacemaker. Now that is still processing, okay. Uh, so the next thing that we're going to do, and as we said, we're basically going through these bar clamps one by one. So even if we happen to run out of time at the end here, no worries, uh, you can always go back to the attendee instructions and run through that. At the end, you're going to have a fully deployed, highly available OpenStack cloud. So the next thing that you're going to deploy, and if you already have the pacemaker uh, bar clamp deployed, you can go straight ahead with that right now, is uh, the database bar clamp. So again, uh, under uh, bar clamps OpenStack, uh, there is one for uh, database. And uh, what that does for you uh, is it installs uh, Postgres in a high availability mode. Again, there are certain things that you need to configure uh, for this, um, which is the Postgres high availability mode. In this case, uh, we're doing that with block device replication uh, with DRBD. And in here, in the uh, database bar clamp, uh, you also have uh, the ability to uh, assign a, a size for the DRBD device that you are about to create. Vincent, are we looking there? We good? By the way, that. That size is, uh, one gigabyte is very important because we've, in this, in this demo environment, we've only set up 
um, a shared lock device that's just over two gigabytes, um, which will have space for both the database LVM volume and Rabbit MQ one. So definitely put one there. If you put anything else, then you'll run out of space on those. And also, I'd like to make, so if you want to uh, take a look at what's going on behind the scenes when you click apply, because it appreciate, you know, we're trying to, we're automating a lot of stuff here, and there's a lot of complexity being hidden. If, you, if you're curious about what's going on behind the scenes, what you can do is, if you SSH to the admin node, again, that's uh, SSH's route to 192.168.124.10, uh, root Linux. And then if you go into the var log crowbar chef client subdirectory, you will see um, logs that come <coughs> automatically from the various nodes. They're collected onto the admin node. So in a consolidated view, for example, you could do like a tail minus F on both of those files from the two controller nodes. And you can see the stuff scrolling past. And you'll see a lot of stuff happening behind the scenes as it installs packages, lays down configuration files, um, stops and starts services, and so on. So uh, again, that path on the admin node is slash var, slash log, slash crowbar, slash chef dash client. And you'll see some log files in there, uh, which should be of definite interest. That exposes all the chef client runs that are happening. Okay, our network cable seems to have yeah, deserted, have issue, deserted us. <coughs> there we go. Okay, here we go. Much better. So, uh, do we? So we know. So the next thing we want to do is we want to set up our database and our uh, and our RabbitMQ uh, for this. Um, yep. So let's go ahead and do that. So back to the bar clamps. Same as before, just create a new proposal. And now here by default, it's suggesting that we just deploy the database in a non-highly available fashion, just using a single controller, controller one. That's this one on the right hand side. But obviously we want to deploy it in HA mode, so we're gonna delete that. And then we just drag the, assign the cluster to the role instead of assigning a single node. Okay, now, because we've done that, we see some new options appear, because in cluster mode, obviously, there are, it's a more complicated setup. Um, you know, where, where are you going to put the, the data for your database? So we have a couple of options here, the shared storage. Uh, in this particular case, we're going to go with DRBD, as we've already mentioned. Oops. Okay, and... Here's the important part. Yeah. Those, that 50 gigabyte default, while great for an actual production setup, is not going to work too well in, uh, in, this, in this virtual setup. I don't think minus three would work too yeah, well either. Yeah, so let's make that one. And uh, apply that. And for those of you who have ever deployed a database in high availability mode manually, this is kind of neat. You know, it's uh, actually can, can we much nicer. Um, show the logs as it it's going past, or is that it? Uh, yeah. Right, no. no. I, yeah, it's a bit complicated because we're, we're running the stuff on one laptop here and we're presenting from another, so the network is a bit funky. Okay, so uh, next thing we're going to do, uh, we have a database, which is the stuff that we need for uh, our uh, stateful, uh, non-volatile data. Um, and uh, next thing is uh, we're going to need a, an AMQP service. And guess what? There's a bar clamp for that. That's the RabbitMQ bar clamp. Uh, that, guess what, installs RabbitMQ uh, in high availability mode. Um, this also uses DRBD. Um, this is actually somewhat optional uh, with, uh, with Icehouse. Um, because in Icehouse, the, uh, a lot of the AMQP code has been sufficiently cleaned up that it really no longer cares what's in the queue if there's something that drops on the floor, it just gets resent. 
Um, in Havana, there were some limitations to that. So since SUSE Cloud 3 is Havana based, it's actually a, fair, uh, a fairly good idea uh, to synchronize the broker queue states. And one way of doing that is to just have a working directory that RabbitMQ uses that is also being replicated. And you can do that on a block uh, or on a file level. Now we should look in here. Okay, successfully applied proposal. That looks very nice. So we're going to uh, go ahead and deploy our, uh, our RabbitMQ block lamp. Okay, let, let's, um, what we'll do is, we'll, yeah, we'll go on to RabbitMQ and then I'll show you something else interesting. So it, it doesn't actually matter if you apply Keystone or RabbitMQ first. Okay, same thing here. We're going to change it to DRBD. One gigabyte, not minus three. And apply. And the next bit is going to be Keystone. Uh, there is a, there's a Keystone bar clamp. Now, here's where we actually enter the realm of um, OpenStack scalability awesomeness. Because uh, once we actually start talking about uh, OpenStack API services, uh, those are, in fact, inherently stateless. So all of their stateful information goes into a database. All of their volatile information goes into an AMQP bus and nothing else is stored in a stateful data store. So the only thing that we need to do here is to actually make sure that uh, we have a Keystone service available. And um, that's why, uh, or that's what, uh, where Pacemaker comes in here. Because Pacemaker, contrary to what many of you may have heard about it, is perfectly fine for managing a scaled out service. In Pacemaker we can do things like uh, tell this thing to deploy X services of a specific type, um, and then make sure that we always have um, X many instances actually available. Um, and then with that, yeah, so we're still applying? Okay. while that's applying, I'm going to show you Hawk very quickly, which is the, um, so we need another tab, uh, I guess. Can there we go. Yeah. Okay, uh, what was the host name again? <laughs> Let me type that for you while you talk about it. Uh, so Hawk is the web interface uh, that provides a deeper look into what's happening in the cluster. And there's, there's a link to that from, if you go to nodes, uh, from the, the top, the drop down, go to the nodes dashboard, and then just pick either of the controllers. And one, once you've deployed, assuming you've, you've got your Hawk and, and your cluster deployed, you'll see a link from the node page that links to the Hawk web interface. And from there, you can get a view from uh, a view of your whole cluster, and that, that's a much more in-depth look. Crowbar, the Crowbar interface is kind of giving you a higher, higher-level view of the, the whole deployment and the orchestration, whereas Hawk is giving you uh, an in-depth in look into a single cluster. So if you have multiple clusters, then there'll be uh, multiple endpoints for, for Hawk. Yeah. So that one's still. Oh, that one's done applying. So that's good. All right. Oh, that's right. Oh, uh, never mind. Oh, oh yeah. Can I please have an IP address for this box? Because apparently your Avahi is doing strange things. All right, great. Okay. So, uh, what, so sanity check. Who's who's got a cluster up and running? Okay, great. Um, so I guess some of you uh, maybe didn't get the files or have encountered other problems. But we, like we said, all this material will be available afterwards. We can answer any questions. You know, fix any issues okay. you may have had or clarify things that maybe we didn't. 
make clear in the, in the script. Um, yeah, okay, so we, oops. Isn't that ugly? There we go. What the hell? So those of you who have the um, database and rabbit applied, go ahead and do, do Keystone. Um, just keep working through the, the script. Most of these bar clamps have, we're, we're going with mostly default options. There's just a few tweaks here and there which are, are listed in the script. Oh yeah, uh, so the, the question is what is the username and password for the HA uh, so the, the Hawk HA web interface, which that's the one that's hyperlinked from the, the nodes. Uh, when you go to the node dashboard and then to a node, there's a hyperlink in there for the Hawk web interface. And the username is HA cluster, and the password is crowbar. That should be in the script as well. But. Okay, and all the other uh, bar clamps are actually re really simple. Um, so, there is a glance bar clamp, which, um, as you may have guessed, uh, installs uh, glance under pacemaker management, has no, uh, no specific settings to modify, nothing like that. The same is true for Cinder, uh, which installs Cinder under pacemaker management. Um, for the purposes of this tutorial, we have uh, set that up uh, to uh, set the type of volume to local file, which means that your persistent volumes are actually going to be stored on your compute nodes. Again, that is just something that you would like to do here in this tutorial, but uh, generally speaking, in a production environment, you might be using, um, uh, you might be using LVM and iSCSI, you might be using Ceph, or uh, whatever strikes your fancy as far as your, uh, your volume storage is concerned. So, and also another thing that is supported is uh, talking, having Cinder talk to uh, your, uh, your SAN interfaces uh, or to your, uh, to your SAN storage. So, do we have a more reliable connection now so we can actually show that or no? Okay. We yep. do? Okay, so let's quickly go through that. Um, here you go, all yours. Right. Okay, so we can see from the little green bubbles that we've got uh, the pacemaker cluster laid down, the database and rabbit are running on top of it. Um, just going to go to the whoops to the dashboard. Here's the link that I was talking about to the Hawk web interface. Uh, it, it's yeah, it's. We've got a strange network set up here, so we can't show you that, but you, hopefully you can. So we're gonna carry on de deploying services. This is all, all default options here. Just drag the cluster in again, it's just suggesting by default a non-HA configuration, so we just change it to HA by dragging the cluster in. Oh yeah, okay, here's Hawk. So HA cluster and crowbar. Loading the status from the cluster, here we go. So the Hawk has various views. Uh, I'm gonna try and, can you, uh, can you zoom into this so that it looks a bit smaller? Yeah, great, thanks. Uh, yeah, so just in case this was beginning to look like smoke and mirrors, it really is <laughs> deploying services on a real cluster. Um, hopefully you can see that on your, on your own machines as well. So in, in this particular view in, in, in Hawk, there's the first column is for the first controller node and the um, second for the 
for the uh, second controller. So you can see we've, we've basically yeah, got all the services up and running on both. Um, feel free to sort of poke around with this interface. I'm not sure if you noticed, but there was actually a clone set in there that said Keystone. Um, and there was actually a, uh, a, an HA proxy that load balanced access to that Keystone, which is kind of nice because Normally, if you need to do this manually, or if you you know you need to hack your own puppet manifest for this, it can become fairly tedious. And in comparison, you know, just dragging a few node names to uh, a few node roles is actually pretty compelling. Uh, so here we go with uh, Glance. Uh, we're adding uh, our cluster one to the Glance server role again. Uh, this basically makes Glance magically become highly available. Um, that's another thing that's kind of nice. Um, the, this, so we, Vagrant has automatically set up a shared local dis, uh, shared disk between the VMs. Uh, no, it hasn't. Uh, it's, uh, yeah, it's NFS on the admin node. And while that's deploying, let's switch back to here. We should be able to see some, some live updates as it deploys that. So you can see that anything prefixed with VIP is a, obviously a floating IP for so, we, uh, and, and there's one on the admin network, so Crowbar is, is network aware, there's an admin network and a public network, and it's created a, a virtual floating IP on both. Um, that's used as the, the HA proxy front end. Um, HA proxy itself is in, is in the cluster, so that's highly available. And Uh, so, from the question was, what, how do you get to that page? Um, if from from the nodes drop down from up here, um, if you go to a dash, the dashboard, select a node, then there's a link from there to the the Hawk interface. I think we're we're probably going to run out of time and not be able to deploy all the services, um, but of course you can you can go ahead and do that on your own laptops. Afterwards. There we go. So that was Glance. And now we're just going to add the final bar clamps here for Cinder, uh, Neutron, Nova, and Horizon. When, as you go through the attendee instructions, uh, do make sure that, or do note that you're deploying, you're obviously deploying your Nova compute services, not to your controller nodes, but to your, uh, to your compute node. So uh, Cinder goes to uh, cluster one. Cinder controller, that is. It's the compute, right. Yeah. Cinder volume goes to one of the compute nodes. And yeah, and we're using a lo the local file um, backend here. So there, there are various views in Hawk, uh, different ways you can look at this. So like, if, for example, if you click on this, you can see all the, all the started ones and see where it started. Um, some resources are master-slave, the, the Postgres and Rabbit ones are master-slave because of DLBD. And we are going to switch here to, uh, where are we at? Uh, the, uh, the Neutron bar clamp, as you would expect, basically installs the Neutron server under uh, Pacemaker Management, Neutron API service. And there is also a uh, specific uh, resource agent, Pacemaker resource agent, to make the Neutron L3 agent highly available and put it under Pacemaker Management. Um, you can select various networking plugins. Um, in this tutorial, we recommend you use the Open vSwitch plugin. There is also a Linux Bridge plugin, um, but uh, Open vSwitch is the one that we have uh, in the attendee list. And then finally, there is a Nova bar clamp, uh, which actually installs our uh, compute infrastructure. So it installs the Nova API, Nova Scheduler Services under Pacemaker Management, um, and then deploys Nova Compute to the compute nodes. All of that is also in uh, 
uh, your Atene nodes. And then finally, there's a Ryzen bar clamp which actually installs um, the Horizon dashboard also as a highly available load balanced uh, service for you. If you set up this cluster um, in your hotel room tonight or uh, at home or at your office, if you want to test your high availability, then you can retrieve your Horizon URL from, uh, from Crowbar. There's an OpenStack dashboard URL uh, that you can get into. Uh, you log in as admin uh, and Crowbar. Uh, you select, and th this is a standard Horizon dashboard as, as, as you would generally expect. Uh, you select the OpenStack project, aka the OpenStack tenant, which is the default tenant that's being installed, and use that dashboard as you normally would. And then you can do bad things to services. Um, like, for example, uh, you could p-kill your OpenStack keystone on uh, your controller node or do the same thing to your OpenStack glance uh, that kills your service on one of your nodes. It will uh, seamlessly fail over and magically become available uh, on the other node. Your, uh, your OpenStack dashboard uh, will not even have a hiccup, typically, um, and uh, will be happy. Uh, you can also do bad things, uh, and while you do that, um, there's two things that you can do to watch what happens uh, in terms of failover. One of those things is Hawk, which we already showed you, which will show you that failover process. There's also command line utility if you're more uh, comfortable with that. This is something that you would execute on the controller node. It's called CRMMON. CRMMON is simply an NCURSUS interface uh, that also shows you the state of your cluster, and you will then see, okay, this uh, monitored service has failed and has been recovered in place. Of course, you can't only do bad things to services in an HA cluster, you can also do bad things to nodes. Uh, you can, for example, do one of these um, on, your, uh, uh, on, on your controller nodes, for example. You can do a power off dash F, which basically kills the node immediately, or uh, you can use your sysrq trigger and echo O or echo B to that. Um, or whatever you prefer. In a virtual box environment, you can, of course, also take the machine and say, shut down, power off the machine. And you will then, again, see either in CRM mon in the command line or in Hawk um, that the failed node is being detected, usually in a matter of a few seconds. Uh, your services fail over, and everything continues to be available and continues to be hunky-dory. So with that, we are going to wrap up this tutorial with a quick summary. Um, so what you learned today, uh, we gave you a little bit of info of the motivation behind OpenStack HA. Recall, not everything is cinnamon rolls and sunshine in terms of OpenStack. Uh, there are certain services that do rely on a shared infrastructure service or rely on a shared state. Um, and for those, we do have to think about high availability. And even for the OpenStack services themselves, what we have is the ability to load balance across them. What we don't have built into OpenStack is an automatic service recovery or the ability to say we always want X many services in a specific OpenStack cloud available at any given time. We summarized various vendors' approaches to OpenStack HA, Ubuntu, Piston, Cisco, Red Hat, and uh, SUSE, and then gave you an overview of um, SUSE Cloud HA. Now, as we said, please, by all means, feel free to continue to peruse the uh, material that we made available to you, that is both the slides uh, and the attendee instructions, and of course, you're also free to use uh, your OVAs and uh, your vacant boxes. All of this stuff is also on GitHub. Um, and that includes the vagrant definitions and uh, these uh, SUSE images, these SLES images were all built with Kiwi um, and uh, all of what you need for that is up there as well. Um, I'm going to put this up uh, back up in just a moment. Uh, I should add that um, the slides that Adam and I put together are all under CC by SA. So if you want to reuse any of these, feel free to do so and again, that is um, the link to, uh, to the material. And uh, with that, we're just about out of time. The next uh, talk here is at uh, 3. Uh, thank you very, very much for coming. Um, and uh, thank you for uh, your interest in this talk. Enjoy the rest of the conference. For those of you hanging around for the remaining Design Summit sessions tomorrow, do enjoy that as well. Um, and as always, uh, in OpenStack, remember, 
experiment, collaborate, contribute. And that's how it becomes more and more awesome. Thank you for your time. See you soon. For those of you who have uh, additional questions for, for your specific uh, setups, uh, we have uh, another five to 10 minutes until the next speaker arrives. So um, if you have any questions, please by all means raise your hands and we'll be happy to come to you and help you out. Thank you.